I'm going to read two sections from the novel, uh, which are both set in the Botanic Garden, uh, and also touch on the issue of terrorism, uh, which has been in the news so much lately. I started to wish after midnight uh, before 9-11. It was 2001, but it was before 9-11, and that'll probably show when I read these sections. Mr. Christensen is pretty much the only white person I know. That sounds like a dumb thing to say, but it's true. I have a couple of teachers who are right, white, but I wouldn't really say I know them, and they sure don't know me. But Mr. Christensen's different. For one thing, he's old, and that makes him pretty harmless. I see him in the garden sometimes, perched on this collapsible stool that looks like it's about to collapse all right. He squints at the flowers and trees, then leans forward and dabs his brush against the canvas. I like to watch him paint, and he says he likes the company. He even painted me one time. I thought the picture would look ugly, but it turned out all right. Actually, it was kind of nice. Mr. Christensen's Danish. He says America is the greatest country in the world. Sometimes he talks about the city and what it was like when he came here as a little boy. He still remembers stopping at Ellis Island. America is a great melting pot, he says, before winking at me. I've heard that before. People say it all the time, and it's in every social studies textbook I've ever read. But that don't mean it's true. I haven't seen much of America. I spent my whole life here in New York. But in this city, people are separate. Blacks and Latinos mix some time, but Asians mostly keep to themselves. Whites might live near us, but they don't live with us. At least that's how things used to be. When I took the train, most of the white people used to get out before me. But these days, more and more of them are staying on the train. Mama says they're pushing deeper and deeper into Brooklyn. So far, no white people have come to live in our neighborhood. Mama says that's the only good thing about living in such a crappy building. White folks are too scared to move in. Mama doesn't like white folks. She says, when I get older, I'll understand why. I haven't told Mom about Mr. About Mr. Christensen. Like I said before, he's just a harmless old man, and he's been real nice to me. One time, he asked me why I only came to the garden on Tuesdays. I said, because that's when it's free. Mr. Christensen looked at me for a minute. Then he got up off that crazy stool, packed up all his art stuff, and told me to follow him. He took me to the visitor center and told the lady behind the desk he wanted to buy me a visitor's pass. The old lady frowned at me, and then she gave Mr. Christensen a real funny look. He just put his money on the counter and waited for her to give me my card. When we were outside again, Mr. Christensen smiled at me. Now the garden is yours every day. That was one of the nicest things anyone had ever done for me. Mr. Christensen is a really sweet man, so I just bite my tongue and listen when he talks about America being the land of opportunity or the great melting pot. I want to ask Mr. Christensen, what happens to the folks who get left at the bottom of the pot? I think whoever's down there probably gets burned. Not just black people either. A while back, they executed a white man for blowing up a government building in Oklahoma. I was just a kid when all that happened, but I remember seeing pictures of what the place looked like afterward. The front half of the building was gone, and you could see all the guts hanging out, wires and hunks of concrete and clouds of dust everywhere. People were screaming and holding their heads, and little babies were being carried out covered in blood. It takes a whole lot of hate to do something like that. Poppy, he didn't like America, and that's why he left, but that white man... He made a bomb and killed 168 people and never said he was sorry. They injected him with poison and the people who watched said he died without showing any remorse. They said he looked like if he wasn't strapped down, he'd have jumped up and done it all over again. Mr. Christensen sees things differently. Sometimes I sit beside him while he paints. I look around the garden and then I look at his canvas. Half the time he's painted something that doesn't even exist. Mr. Christensen says he paints what's in his mind's eye. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe he just sees what he wants to see. Maybe he can do that because he's old and white. All I know is, when I look around me, I only see what's real. So the next section I'm going to read uh, is when Jenna sees something that's not real. She has, uh, Jenna's a 15-year-old African-American girl, Afro-Latino girl. Her father's from Panama. And she has a boyfriend, Judah, who's a Rastafarian from Jamaica. And Jenna's mother doesn't like her seeing Judah. So they get into a fight one night, and Jenna's mother slaps her across the face. She runs out. And because she lives across the street from the Botanic Garden, she sees that there's a wedding reception going on and takes that opportunity to slip into the garden. 
So this scene is Jenna in the garden late at night. She has a habit of going there to make wishes in the fountain, and she figures this is the night where she really just needs one more wish. I reach the cherry esplanade, and the long open field glows as though it's covered in frost. The moon is so bright that I squint up my eyes and search for the safety of shadows. I decide to cut through the rose garden, and when the scent of rotting petals reaches my nose, I realize why I'm here. I walk quickly, no longer unsure of my destination. I know where I'm going. Some part of me must have known this was where I needed to be, like the instinct Mr. Christensen told me about that tells birds how to find their way home. I pass through the white wooden gate of the rose garden and climb the steps that lead to the fountain. It waits for me in the moonlight, its water murmuring softly. Beyond the fountain and past the long stretch of grass, I can hear the faint sound of engines and horns as cars race along the parkway outside the garden gates. A rabbit bounding across the pale field stops and stares at me, its nose twitching nervously. But I am like a statue frozen beside the fountain, and within seconds the rabbit disappears. It is only after I have spent several minutes staring at the silvery surface of the water that I realize I have no coins. I fish deep into the pocket of my jeans, but my nails dig up only lint. I stare at the water again. The fountain is like a round mirror held up to the night sky. I step closer and peer into the water, hoping yet fearing to see my own reflection. Before I can catch a glimpse of myself, a cool breeze ripples the water, and the liquid mirror loses its image. I feel like I must be invisible, and my eyes start to well up. I tell myself it's only the wind, but the tears are falling freely, and my cheek is still stinging, and it feels like Mama hit me all over again. I stumble over to the whispering bench. I cry as softly as I can, even though I'm alone. My tears empty out of me, but the hurt doesn't go away. I sit on the curved bench and think of all the wishes I've made at this fountain. I'm still waiting for them to come true. I remember the first time Judah kissed me, and the salty tears make my lips burn. I wish Judah were here beside me or down at the other end of the bench. I wish he were here to tell me everything's going to be all right. His words would slide around the bench in a whisper, just like they did that time before when Judah told me I was different. I am different. When Judah said it, he meant it in a good kind of way, but right now I don't feel special. All I feel is lost and alone. After a while, the tears stop falling, and I lean back against the hard stone bench. I wonder if Taiwan's still asleep in the bed, or if Mama woke him up just so she'd have something to hold. Taiwan is all she has left. And what do I have? Nothing. Not even a penny to waste on another worthless wish. I look over at the fountain and consider scooping coins out of the water, but that doesn't seem like somehow stealing other folks' wishes. It would be like robbing a grave, disturbing the dead. I lean forward and search my back pockets for change, but find a scrap of paper instead. The words are faded and the light is dim, but I have no problem reading Judah's haiku. The words echo and swirl around me, five, seven, five. The poem is short, yet when I finish reading, the whispering goes on. Please don't leave me. Take me with you. Don't look back. Stay with me. Hold my hand. I'm frightened. Don't let go. They're coming. Run. Startled, I stand and look around, worried that I'm not alone after all. In the distance, another rabbit stops halfway across the field. He rises up on his haunches, sniffs the air suspiciously, then continues on his way. I want to trust the rabbit, but my own instinct tells me something is wrong. I look along the bench, but it's empty. I check the shadows nearby, but find only leaves shifting in the breeze. Cautiously, I return to the bench. I perch on its edge like a bird, ready to take flight. There is only silence around me. I turn and check the bushes beside me, then ease further onto the bench. Despite the hard stone, my tired body relaxes. I close my eyes and try once again to conjure Judah. I picture him sitting across from me at the other end of the bench, his full lips broken apart in a smile, his teeth shining like pearls. Then the voices return. Don't trust anyone. Look for the signs. Sleep during the day. Run at night. Don't look back. Help others if you can, but help yourself first. I'll meet you there. I'll find you. I will. I promise. Just don't look back. Despite the warning, I do look back. I turn and look over my shoulder, and what I see there shocks me so much that I scream. Something strong and sudden like a jolt of electricity hurls me from the bench. I fall on the hard, flat stones that circle the fountain, too stunned to feel any pain. I plant my hand over my mouth to keep from screaming again. On the bench, in the exact spot where I was sitting just a moment ago, is a child. Though the bench is smothered in shadows, this little boy is glowing like a statue of ice. He watches me with his dark, frightened eyes, and then he whispers, Don't leave me. 
The air in the garden chills. Suddenly I shiver as fear and a cold wind raise the hairs on the back of my neck. My eyes are fixed on the ghostly boy, but another voice pulls my gaze away. A silver-white woman emerges from the black shadows beneath the wisteria. She has a shawl wrapped around her shoulders and a long skirt that touches the ground. She whispers, don't tell, and takes a step toward me. Terror chokes the scream that is rising in my, thro in my throat, for we are no longer alone. The terrace around the fountain is crowded with children, women, and men. The shimmering ghosts all wear clothes that come from another time. All glisten in the moonlight just like silver coins underwater. All plead with me to stay, to go, to help them, to take care. They move silently across the cold, flat stones. Please, please, please. The ghosts look desperate, but not unkind. I try hard to swallow my fear. Questions whirl inside my mind. Where did you come from? Why are you here? What do you want from me? But before I can utter a single word, a nearby tree starts to shake violently, and a swarm of starlings descends without warning. I cover my head with my arm and stay close to the ground. In the chaos of flapping wings and frantic cries, the cluster of ghosts disintegrates and the silvery figures disappear. Silence and shadows surround me. I pull myself up from the ground and try to think of an explanation for what I have just seen. I quickly scan the garden for traces of silver, but instead a flush of red catches my eye. Something small is lying on the ground a few feet away from the fountain. It glints in the moonlight and I move toward it, but a cloud covers the moon and I have to fumble for it in the dark. My fingers feel only the cold, hard stone, and so I stop, stand back, and wait for the moon to return. The cloud doesn't budge, but then I see it shining again. What else could it be besides a penny? A worthless coin someone dropped and never bothered to pick up. I reach for it again, but once again it disappears in a darkness that wasn't there just a moment ago. Now I'm determined. I can feel a wish trembling on my lips. The moon slides out of the clouds like a hand pulled from a glove. The penny glows and then dies like a fiery spark. I reach for it, and this time I feel it beneath my fingertips. Though it is strangely hot, I pick it up, then move closer to the fountain, into the light of the moon. The penny cools in my palm. It grows dull and old, even though it was flashing like a new coin just a minute ago. I stare at the penny, and the longer I stare, the less certain I feel that my wish will ever come true. I close my hand into a fist, and I squeeze the round, hard piece of copper. I want to hurl it into the still water, but it weighs in my hand like a rock. The longer I hold it, the heavier it becomes, and I have to struggle to raise my hand up to my shoulder. For a moment, I stand frozen, the penny in my hand, my hand poised beside my head. The fountain blurs, and I blink back my tears. Then with all the strength I can muster, I throw the penny up into the air.